Good evening and welcome to the Beyond the Walls lecture series. This collaborative series is a partnership between the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at Ontario Tech and Oshawa Public Libraries. We are happy to be joining you online from the Charles Street Building at Ontario Tech and also online. So welcome to our online uh, participants. My name is Jennifer Gardner and I'm the manager of uh, community engagement programming and the Just Hand branch at Oshawa Public Libraries. And I will be your host and moderator for this evening's program. The land we are standing on today is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We acknowledge that Oshawa is covered under the Tr Williams Treaties and as settlers on this land, we are all treaty people. May we respectfully honor the knowledge and understanding of the indigenous stewards of these ancestral lands and ensure that the voices of the First Peoples are represented in our collections, programs, and services. As a settler, I'm grateful for the opportunity to learn, live, and work on this land. Did you know October is Canadian Library Month? And this week is Ontario Public Libraries Week. During this time, Libraries and library partners across Canada raise awareness of the valuable role libraries play in Canadian lives. Our topic this evening is called Turning the Page, Libraries in the 21st Century. And it'll be a lively discussion about how university and public libraries function as part of our communities, how they've adapted to the changing times and why you will want to have a library card. We have a group of esteemed librarians joining us on the panel tonight, and our presentation will be a Q&A format. For those of you joining us on Zoom, please feel free to enter your questions in the chat or raise your hand when, and when we get an audience, when we get to the audience question part, we will invite you to unmute your mic and ask your question. For those of you joining us in person, Thank you for joining us in person. Please feel free to help yourselves to the treats. And, um, and, we, and uh, if you have any questions at the end, we would be happy to uh, answer them. Thank you. Okay, over to the panel. So I'm gonna ask, uh, hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourselves, your organizations, and tell us what excites you most about working in the library. We'll start with Vicki. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Vicki Albrecht. I am the manager of the Durham Campus Library and Learning Center at Trent University's Durham Greater Toronto Area, GTA campus here in Oshawa, Ontario. And um, I am very excited because uh, the campus I'm at here in Oshawa is continuing to grow and we're seeing that growth also in the library. So as the number of students grows, we have to have more staff, we have to have more resources, and that's very exciting to be part of that growth. Thank you, Vicki. Welcome. Okay, next we're going to go to David. Hi, everybody. My name is David Lewinster. I'm the manager of the McLaughlin Library, which is part of the Oshawa Public Libraries system. It's a four branch system here in Oshawa. And uh, the branch that I work out of is uh, downtown. It's the flagship uh, branch of the system over on Bagot Street. And so I manage a, a large team of library folk and we uh, have a full service library with a makerspace and a local history room and a standalone children's library. Did I say makerspace? Um, well, we have a makerspace too. And so in terms of why I'm excited, um, I'm gonna give the cliche answer, um, but many cliches are true. And I think this one is true also. It's libraries are, public libraries, I believe are one of the last true um, democratic spaces where anyone can access the space and engage in it however they choose without any expectation of a financial transaction of any kind. So it's an institution that gives a whole lot back to the community and asks um, very little of their users in return. And I think that's an inspiring mission and I'm proud to be a part of it. And next we'll go to Emily. 
My name is Emily Tufts and I'm the Associate University Librarian for Scholarly Resources at Ontario Tech. Um, and so my job means that I'm responsible for collections and services that support teaching, learning and research at Durham College and Ontario Tech University. Working in libraries is so exciting for me because we get to experiment with technology, research, publishing. The work we do supports the cutting edge research that's taking place at Durham College and Ontario Tech. Um, so we kind of get to have our, our fingers in lots of different pies across the institution. Um, but perhaps for me, the most important part about working in libraries is the fact that the work that we do every day really supports students in achieving their goals and their dreams. Um, I've heard people say that nobody graduates from the library, but nobody graduates without one. And that's really meaningful for me. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Emily. Lots of exciting reasons to work at a library. So many common themes I heard across the academic and public systems, including equity, technology, cutting edge services, and variety of work, community engagement, and helping, helping people achieve success. So we're going to move on to the, uh, the, the second uh, question. Um, libraries have always changed as society evolved around them and have sought to find ways to remain relevant. What current disruptors, technological or otherwise, represent the greatest threat to libraries as we know them? And what can libraries do to ensure that we endure another hundred years? Emily, let's start with you. Jen. I mean, I would reframe that right away. Are we talking about threats or are we talking about opportunities? Libraries have always shown throughout our history that we are resilient, we're adaptive, we're responsive to the changing needs of our communities. Um, so I see all these changes not as threats, but as real opportunities for us to grow and adapt. Um, some of the, the challenges and opportunities that we face are things like expanding portfolios. So in academic libraries, we're increasingly asked to, to do new and exciting things. We want to experiment with new modes of knowledge creation and dissemination. We want to look at um, digital scholarship, interdisciplinary research. We want to support things like the preservation publishing of research data. All these are really exciting things for us. But we need to continue to support our core mandates, right? Providing these resources that people need providing research help and teaching students and faculty how to find the information that they need to do their work. Um, so this challenge requires rethinking and creating new and more resilient staffing and service models so that we can continue to deliver on those core mandates, but also have fun experimenting and pushing the boundaries of what libraries can traditionally be. Um, we also see sort of challenges with the transition to online access. So if you think about in the good old days, you would buy a physical book, it would be on the shelf forever. Um, but now as we move to online access, we're seeing vendors and publishers move more towards like um, a lease model rather than an ownership model. Uh, we have an example recently of a major academic publisher, uh, Wiley, removed all their textbooks this year from one of the major aggregator platforms. And so students and faculty who had been really used to expecting to find those textbooks in the library weren't able to find them anymore. And the publisher basically said, mm, it's not really a good business model for us to sell them to libraries. So we're just gonna sell them to individual students. And that was a real blow. Um, but this was a real opportunity for advocacy. And so what we saw in the wake of this Wiley textbook poll was that libraries and consortial library organizations banded together and started talking about this the way I'm talking about it. And, and the result of that publicity and that advocacy was that Wiley reversed their decision they put that material back in those ebook aggregators, and so our students are now able to access them. So um, while it is a threat, this idea uh, that publishers can just yank content out of platforms, there is a real opportunity for us to be advocates for our students. Um, similarly, this the spread of misinformation and disinformation is a real threat, right? Not only to libraries, but to our civilization. Uh, but it is an opportunity for us to position ourselves as critical players in this space of misinformation to teach people the 21st century literacies uh, and the skills that they need to be able to find and to evaluate and to ethically use information, um, not just in their lives as students, but in their lives as citizens. Uh, Vicki, do you wanna add in, please? Uh, thanks, Jen. So Emily touched upon a lot of the online resources. And so when I've, thought about this question, I thought about online education and how during the pandemic, uh, many people got used to doing online education. Students were taking courses that way. 
do I see it as a threat? It's more likely a big opportunity, as Emily also mentioned, for us to be in that space. Beforehand, professors would be forcing students to walk through the library door and physically touch a book and take it off the shelf and look through it. So now we have the opportunity to recreate the library in a more online space. So there are libraries out there that have created second worlds where you can virtually go in with a VR headset and actually touch books in a virtual space. So I think these technologies are actually an area where we can really grow and show people that we are still available to use as a library as if you're in a physical space. Okay, and David. So uh, I'm the odd person out here being the lone sort of panelist in the public library. So I'm gonna take a different different tact a little bit. Um, libraries uh, have always been, or public libraries have always been uh, an innovative solution to complex problems. Um, I'm gonna go back in time a bit and, and do a little potted history of, of the public library. And public libraries started uh, in the sort of latter part of the 19th century uh, and they were called mechanics institutes. And uh, this was a time when we were transitioning from a, a, a rural agricultural society to a, a, an urban industrial society. And we needed people who are literate enough to be able to read instructions to operate equipment in, in, in factories. And also uh, these were, um, this model was subscription based. So it was kind of like the Netflix of its day. You paid a certain amount of money per year and you got access to, um, to books and you got to go to lecture, uh, a lecture series. And a lot of some of the, some of the same things we do as public libraries um, on today. And uh, Emily mentioned uh, uh, the good old days after the, the Mechanics Institute kind of morphed into, uh, into the free public libraries that, that we have now, we enjoyed a long period of stability. Um, if you wanted something, it was probably in the form of a book. And unless you had a private collection and unless you were very wealthy, you had to use the library. And we had a captive audience and that was um, good in a lot of ways, but um, but of course nothing lasts. And, and when the internet sort of came into prevalence in the 1990s and of course exploded from there, the libraries had to adapt and they showed amazing resiliency and ingenuity as we completely overhauled the business model and brought in public access computers, brought in wireless internet, um, started adding, uh, doing more aggressive outreach to attract new customers, adding different programs to our programming um, slate and adding new digital resources and adding variety to the types of things that we lend out to customers. And as a result, you have the, 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 the modern thriving internet uh, public libraries that you have today. But uh, I'm going to go more in the threat direction, though, uh, than my colleagues. Uh, I feel like, uh, you know, that first, um, with that first digital revolution, we, we could really lean into providing uh, uh, a computer instruction and information literacy instruction to, to a population that was not familiar with computers. Now, the people using the public libraries were raised with computers and raised with social media, raised with having supercomputers in their pockets. So um, that part of, 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 the, of our core business uh, is, is going to have to change fundamentally, I think, um, in, in the near future. Um, and so um, some of the hallmarks of, of social media, which is the primary media people are consuming online right now, are things that are sort of antithetical to uh, our traditional uh, content. Uh, it's short viral um, content that is often designed to, to enrage or to distract from some of humanity's uh, bigger problems and, and uh, very smart, very well compensated software engineers are designing these uh, platforms to make it hard to resist and hard to leave once you get there. So, um, so how do we exist in this milieu? And that's, that's, that's what I sometimes lie awake at night and, 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 and thinking about. Um, and I, I don't quite know the answer of, of where we fit in this, in this kind of brave new, new world of the second digital revolution. But I, I, I think I know what the wrong thing to do is. And I think it's to try and is to move away from our, our, our values to match where the culture is going. I think our values are allowed us to thrive for the last 100, you know, and 30, 40, 40 years. And I think we can somewhat define ourselves in opposition to some of the more uh, pernicious elements of social media. Um, for example, you know, in, in, the, in ways that we're different is that we're not motivated by a financial bottom line. We're not trying to extract your data or your money. 
Um, we don't have an interest in enraging you or moving you to a different position. We are purveyors of long form uh, entertainment that's meant to inspire and, and improve your mental health. Um, and we are genuinely interested in helping the most vulnerable, marginalized people find that job, get early literacy education, get connectivity at home, pay their taxes, et cetera. So I think we could be an antidote and a salve to sort of a world that's a little weary of what, what you know, Zuckerberg is continuing to push on us. So that's my rant and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so, um, so what I'm hearing is, you know, uh, libraries have been incredibly nimble. You know, there's what seems to be opportunities that can also be threats. Uh, technology has been um, one of the drivers uh, of both. Um, and uh, it certainly is apparent that both university and public libraries have the ability to flex, to be flexible and adapt to the changing needs of uh, society and uh, the changing needs of technology. Um, moving on, we, uh, we have another question here. Um, so public libraries, public and academic libraries both consider intellectual freedom and equitable access to information as a foundational principle. One of the challenges inherent in the commitment to these ideals is the need to balance competing sets of rights and ensuring that the needs of one group of users does not supersede the interests of another group. Can you speak to how your library has grappled with this issue and how have you, or how have you persevere, preserved access to material and viewpoints, even if the material may be considered object, objectionable to some? So let's start with David. That was a very long question. Um, <laughs> yes. So, uh, good thing I got, uh, I got the question in advance. So, um, so yeah, this, this is very relevant in, in public libraries. It's a challenge that we live every day. Um, there's, there's sometimes in public libraries, we like to say that, that we have something to offend everybody. Uh, and, and that's very true. We're, we're an equal opportunity offender. Um, these are American stats, but I'm going to quote them anyway. Um, in the last couple of years, there's been a, a surge, you know, by orders of magnitude in, in the number of banned and challenged books. The American Library Association reported that uh, there were uh, 729 attempts to ban or challenge material, which, which equates to about 1,600 individual banned or challenged titles. Uh, well, you know, the United States is a big country, so that might not sound impressive, but it's up from 273 in, in the year prior. So, and these challenges aren't, aren't random. They're not picking, you know, books out of a hat. These are, uh, these are books that are, are, are fall under specific themes, and that is uh, anti-racism and uh, books that represent LGBTQ plus perspectives. Um, so, that's something that we, as, an, as, a, uh, as a sector, public libraries and school libraries, are, are definitely grappling, grappling with. And I look at this issue uh, through the lens. Oh, my thingy's is not down. Uh, I look at this uh, through the lens of rights and responsibilities. And uh, you can't have a right without a responsibility and, and vice versa. Um, so for example, the public library has, has the right to purchase items and to um, promote programs that are in line with our collection policy and with our and in line with our commitment to intellectual freedom. But we also, and we have a responsibility to represent all points of view as we're a taxpayer funded institution. So we don't actually have a choice, we have to, because otherwise we'd be putting thumb on our, the thumb, the thumb, our thumbs on the scales. But conversely, uh, our, our customers certainly have the right to protest and, and to object. And uh, they, have a, they have a charter protected constitutional right uh, uh, to, to make their displeasure known if they want something out of our collection or want us to not do a program because it conflicts with their view or the views of their communities. But so th that is fairly you know, non-controversial, but, but I, I, I think that they also have a responsibility here because you can't have a right without a responsibility. And um, everyone claims they have a right to an opinion, but I would say not really. I think, I think you have a right, but it is conditional. It's not a categorical right. I think if you have an opinion that you wish to uh, share, I think you have the responsibility to make an, uh, an, an attempt to inform yourself about the issues, which requires reading the book that you're objecting to and actually attending the program that you say you, you, you disapprove of. So uh, users uh, focus heavily on their, their right to ob object um, without always considering the responsibilities that, 
that are wrapped up in that as well, as well as the rights of the institution to pursue our mandates. So um, I'll end with just a quick um, example, if I could. So uh, a few months ago, uh, we, we ran a drag queen story time uh, at Oshawa Public Library in collaboration with our regional partners. All the uh, public libraries in Durham region ran this program. And we always get a bit of uh, heat from this program, but this, this year it went up again by orders of magnitude. So, um, and we dealt with this, we grappled with it um, similarly to how we might deal with complaints about our collections. Uh, we acknowledge that people have the right not to attend, they have the right to protest, they have the right to complain to whomever they feel would be sympathetic. Um, but rights are not absolute. There's an expression that goes that, you know, the right to swing my fist ends where the other person's nose begins. And that's true here too. So your right to protest in, uh, ends when it interferes with my right to uh, participate in something that might give my life meaning or give me access to uh, information that I consider to be to be critical. It was a successful program. Over a hundred uh, attendees. All our all of our CEOs. I'm proud to say signed a uh, a statement that uh, reflected our our commitment to free expression, ensuring that voices of people who have long been silenced were able to be heard. And I'm I'm just very proud of how my organization handled that situation. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, David. Um, let's go to Emily. Emily, can you talk a little bit about how your library, um, how your library grapples with, uh, with material? Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. And thank you, David. I tell you, I do not envy my colleagues in the public library sector around things like challenges to books and material and programming, because that's a hard situation to find yourself in and um, amazing that Oshawa Public Library and the other Durham Region CEOs signed that um, letter of solidarity. Uh, in academic libraries, we have a bit of a different situation because um, when we're balancing rights and responsibilities in a university library, we're thinking about things like academic freedom, intellectual freedom and charter rights to expression and assembly. Um, and access to information like David kind of alluded to is at the heart of all these rights um, and freedoms. So universities and libraries have always been places for debate and inquiry. Um, we're places that are based in science and evidence. Um, and divergent viewpoints are kind of essential in knowledge creation and transformation. So we see on university campuses long traditions of student activism that have shaped some of the most important social movements of the 20th and 21st centuries. We saw things like anti-war protests, civil rights protests, feminism and LGBTQ rights, um, socialism and environmental justice. All these movements have really strong roots on university campuses. Um, I think, uh, as David said, strong policy frameworks are and a continual return to the touchstone of our mandate as an academic library is key when we're balancing competing interests. I mean, we're here to support the teaching, learning, and research missions of Ontario Tech and Durham College. And so if we can continue to return to that sort of core mandate um, that we're here to deliver, I think, I think we can entertain all kinds of um, divergent and radical viewpoints in a university library. Um, so like I say, I don't always envy my colleagues in the public library because I think that it's a hard tightrope to walk for you folks. And we're a little bit lucky in our ivory tower because this kind of debate is something that um, we have we have maybe less at at stake a little bit just because of our position. So less challenges, like yeah. And Vicky, how about you at Trent? Uh, yeah. Um, so at Trent, I was just going to mention Trent University actually has a center for human rights, equity, and accessibility. And on their website, when you go and look at it, it states Trent scholarship is informed by the principles of full and fair inquiry and all members of the community are participating and valued as equals. So when you have a statement like that coming down from the university, it makes it quite easy for a library and archives at Trent to tap into that and to say that we're supporting the mission that's coming from this institution completely. And uh, with that viewpoint, that helps us to conduct informed uh, sc scholarship, as well as helping to inform 
future citizens in our society, having that access to those diverse viewpoints. In addition to that, um, when we're looking at objectionable items, so we do have library and archives. So many archival documents are biased. They are put into context. So archival work is now going back to those records and adding more contextual information to put that into perspective. So I was recently uh, attending a webinar where an archivist had shown uh, a photo where there was a child for Halloween in blackface. And so painted with blackface and looking like a, a even though it was a white child, so they went back and they added some descriptive information to kind of explain what the context was. And so that a person doesn't necessarily have to go and view that photo right away, that that description's up front. So in case people get offended by it, they have that information there. So that is one example of how to deal with some of the information afterward, after the fact. And that's a great example, Vicki. Thanks for sharing. How do academic and public libraries work together? So um, this program, for instance, this is, a, this is a clear example of how uh, universities and public libraries work together. Um, but uh, can you share some examples and tell us why people benefit from both? And we'll start with Vicki. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so actually today was a perfect example of that. We had a person come into the library at uh, Trent University's Durham campus, and they were interested in getting computer access. Now our computer access at Trent is limited to staff and students on the campus. However, we had publications, bookmarks, show them the website and show them where the closest Oshawa Public Library branch was. So to provide them and explain to them how we could assist as well as how Oshawa Public Libraries do their jobs at making sure that there is more technology access for individuals who may not be part of a specific academic community. Uh, additionally, uh, Early in September, we had both Oshawa Public Library and Whitby Public Library in attendance at our orientation events and talking about public library cards, getting people signed up for public library cards, because students in the academic libraries don't necessarily have fun and free books available to them. Most of our books we consider pretty heavy with research and scholarship supporting that. Now, there are lots of scholars who would say the whole collection is a lot of fun, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, we want to be sure that they know that there is areas in the community where they can get those sort of materials to balance their mental health, to balance out all the stress that they have from their studies. Thank you, Vicki. Certainly is a, is a pleasure to partner with Trent and we love any opportunity to do outreach and, you know, and connect with your students and uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic opportunity for collaboration. And Emily, how about Ontario Tech? There's a, there's a few different ways that we've been partnering. Yeah, so we have a, an interesting partnership with the Oshawa Public Library. We have what we call a pocket library in our fireside reading room at the North Oshawa campus. And those are books that are, are from the Oshawa Public Library's collection, more stuff that wouldn't be found in an academic library, like cookbooks and leisure reading and, and that kind of popular content. Um, and those are free for students to come and take. And, and so it helps us add that sort of element to our collection. Um, I see public library and academic library collections as being really complementary. So while our focus is on supporting curriculum and research at the academic level, um, Public libraries can provide access to children's and YA content that is used really heavily, for example, by our students in the Faculty of Education here at 61 Charles. Like we can't offer all the children's books that the public library can. So those referrals happen all the time. Likewise, there are specialized um, online resources that the public libraries have. And we're so grateful to Oshawa Public Libraries for their, um, their digital library card, which is available to anyone 
in the province of Ontario. So we often will refer our students to the Oshawa Public Library to access their online materials, for example, LinkedIn Learning. So this is a really valuable um, self-directed online learning resource that we used to have access through through ministry funding at the colleges and universities. And then we lost access. And so a lot of our students and faculty were really left kind of scrambling. And so that digital library card that's available to our students was huge for us, especially during COVID when all of a sudden there wasn't any more in-person um, sort of tutorial options available for students. So that was huge for us. Um, on the academic library side, though, we have a lot to offer public library users. So we have a community borrower program that provides access to all of the library's physical materials for members of the community. There's no charge for that. So if you have a need for really specialized academic research literature, you can come and borrow using a community borrower card from our library. Um, as well, we provide walk-in user access to many of our specialized online resources. So lots of our um, online resources like research databases, online journals, all these really specialized academic research resources are licensed by the vendors for people who are not affiliated with the university, but who are physically present in our library. So you can come to the library and um, our staff will log you into a computer and provide you with access to our online resources, which can be really helpful, um, especially if we have uh, folks who are doing really specialized research in health science, for example, um, or maybe alumni who have graduated who are looking to still access some of those academic resources, they can come to our library and still still get that kind of access. Um, and that's kind of a, a, a bit of a secret, the fact that we, uh, we offer access to those academic resources for members of the community. Thanks, Emily. Yes, it, it uh, was one of those surprising things actually that I didn't think about is the community community user card that we can we can access. It certainly is a huge benefit. Um, great, thank you. Um, David. Sure, uh, one of the bad things about going last is that other people take all your talking points. So <laughs> thanks a lot, guys. Um, yeah, but we are we are um, really complementary, as as Emily said. We're we're close cousins. We're we're chimp chimpanzees and bonobos, and um, and we're natural partners. Uh, so I really think we're we're two sides of of a, of a coin. Um, and uh, as as has been mentioned, uh, of course, university and college students get access to our libraries and other Durham uh, regional libraries because they're residents of the respective communities, and and vice versa. Uh, there's some access given to um, to um, non-students to to university and colleges so it is it is a wonderful cozy partnership and again i don't know if everyone knows about that uh, i mean i think most people know they're eligible for a library card but they might not go go might not know it goes the other way as well um, so it's true we are similar but we do have different mandates and i think there is a lot of value to sort of staying semi-siloed and, and sticking to our lanes uh, somewhat um, so we don't exist to support the curriculum and written right into our collection policy it says that explicitly that we we are not here for your curricular needs but that's not to say that that the works that we have in our print collection can't support your curriculum it's just not explicitly why we would buy the material but it might we have a lot of uh, we have a a, a huge uh, comprehensive print collection um i think the biggest in the in the derb region and 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 really quite quite extensive so there will will be materials in our um in our in our collections that are very rigorous and scientifically uh, thorough and useful for completing assignments and with respect to our our electronic resources and digital platforms we 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 steer clear of you know peer peer reviewed uh, um, uh, 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 journal databases and primary sources this is the province of my colleagues here, but we we still have access to popular resources that could absolutely feed into assignments and to support you know the the journey of of the student, and then we have uh, you know, we have non curricular uh, you know or co curricular um, things uh, that that develop soft skills. Uh, and LinkedIn Learning has been mentioned. And um, if you don't know LinkedIn Learning, you should go get a digital library card right now. You can do it literally right now on our website. You can get a library card spit out at you instantly uh, if you just navigate to the place on our website. And you could be on LinkedIn Learning tonight. And uh, um, it, 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 it teaches you things that, that you could absolutely apply in your, your studies, like getting better at those tricky uh, Excel uh, formulas and uh, learning study skills and public speaking and, and such. But also fun stuff you can learn how to play the ukulele and learn how to do python coding and and 
almost anything you can think of. Uh, it's like YouTube, except no ads and, and the content is generally of a higher production value. Um, uh, so, um, as, as, as Vicky mentioned as, as well, though, there, there's, there's, of course, more to being a student than, than studying. So we also fill that other part of, of the void, the downtime, the relaxation, the mental health, and the fun. So the public libraries um, bring the fun, and there's a lot of human connection you can, you can experience here through our, through our programs. If you want to actually, you know, stop doom scrolling and stop doing your, your homework and come out and talk to people, we can, we can support you there. And then also mentioned, we have, um, we're, we're, we are, we're everywhere. I mean, we have four branches, we will have five. Um, uh, and our, our other libraries in, in the region are similarly geographically, you know, well represented. Um, I pulled some stats the other day, according to in 2020 data, it revealed there's uh, 1,113 libraries or library service points in Ontario. Um, so that's a lot. It's a big province, but if you consider there's 500 McDonald's in, in, the, in the province, that should give you a sense of how we are everywhere. 90, 99% of Ontarians live somewhere served by a public library system, and uh, Ontario public libraries provide access to over 30 million books or about two and a half books um, per resident. I don't, I don't know what you'll do with half a book, but that's your problem. So um, yeah, so we encourage uh, students to come visit us, get to know us, uh, use our staff, use our facilities, attend our programs. Thanks, We're David. I, I think uh, one of the things that uh, that wasn't mentioned was uh, the relationship that we have. Uh, David, you talked about programming. Um, the engineering department at Ontario Tech uh, is a wonderful resource for Oshawa Public Libraries. We have STEM star kits in our collection, uh, which people can borrow with their library card and they can learn a little bit about technology and coding. And we also have uh, see wonder workshops, you know, so it's it really um, leverages the public library to have access to subject matter expertise uh, with the engineering department at Ontario Tech and allows the general public to participate in these uh, these, you know, things like uh, steam related programs. Um, so yes, it's a it, it's a wonderful symbiotic relationship that academic and public libraries have. So our final question, we're, I'm just looking a little bit at the time here. We have about 20 minutes left and we wanna to get to questions and my headphones are slipping off here. Um, is a bit of a shameless uh, promotion here. So what are some services and programs that your library provides that no one would expect? Okay, so something that, you know, that the public will, you know, the public, the student population, people may not know. Um, so let's, let's, let's start with Emily. Emily, what's surprising? Oh, lots are surprising. So just like you would expect, we have all those peer reviewed academic journal article type stuff, but um, we also lend out uh, kits and manipulative STEM kits. We have uh, a collection at our education branch here at 61 Charles Street of the Ontario textbook collection. Um, so the required textbooks in uh, language arts and math in the K-12 curriculum are there and used heavily by our uh, faculty of education students, but also by um, recent graduates who are out teaching or perhaps our substitute teaching will come in to use that collection in the library and uh, plan their lesson. Um, we have a puppet theater at the education branch downstairs with like Sesame Street style puppets and a puppet play theater. Um, we lend all kinds of equipment. Some of our most popular items are things like uh, laptops and headphones and chargers and um, mouse, wireless mouse and a headset. Today we were getting ready for this um, panel presentation and we realized, oh, the guests from the public libraries and from Trent don't have access to our Wi-Fi network. So I just like popped downstairs to talk to Kathy in the education branch and borrowed some ethernet cables. And that's how we were able to get everybody online today. So um, all kinds of equipment. We um, Calculators are one of our most popular items. Students will come and they'll be like, oh, I have a test, I have to borrow your calculator. Um, and then we have podcasting kits here at the social science and education branch and also at the main North Oshawa library. So people can check out a podcasting kit and do, um, high quality audio recording at home. And it gets checked out not only by students, but also by faculty who are delivering lecture material online um, 
in audio format. We have uh, technology spaces as well. So we have a 3D printing service in our library. We have a digital recording studio at the North Oshawa branch that people can book out to. And again, it gets used by students doing um, presentations, recorded presentations, but also faculty who are delivering lecture content. Um, we've got all kinds of spaces to meet diverse needs. So just like you would expect silent study, group study, uh, we've got a uh, lounge area in our fireside reading room. We have an event space where people can reserve to, to book events just like this one. Um, but we also have a lactation room for people who are um, pumping or nursing. We have uh, a low sensory space for people who really need low lighting. We've got adaptive technology workstations with height adjustable desks um, for people who need that kind of equipment. Uh, we also do all kinds of publishing. So people often think about libraries as sort of repositories and providers of information, but we also support publishing. So we host open journals, open access journals on our open journal systems platform, um, digital repositories, not just for like typical text-based stuff, but also all kinds of, um, we're branching out now into digital repositories that can store media and images, that kind of thing. Uh, Ontario Tech has an archive, which has one of the largest um, significant archival collections of the history of engineering in Canada. So we get archival deposits from engineering societies in Canada that covers the history uh, of engineering. Um, we also have donations from like OPG and places like that. And then the interdepartmental collaboration that we experiment with is really important to us. So we collaborate with the Teaching and Learning Center, which is located in the library at our main campus. Um, but also like film screenings, yoga classes, affordable education advocacy campaigns, art installations. These are all collaborations that we've done with um, Student Life, Student Union, Indigenous Education and Cultural Services. So the library is like a, a place where everybody can come and all that kind of interdepartmental collaboration can happen. That sounds wonderful. It certainly is like the library of things too. Uh, David, what's what's something surprising that people may not necessarily know that Oshawa Public Library has. All right. Well, when Emily was speaking, I couldn't help but feel competitive and, and, and I had this instinct to try and one up. Emily really kicked in. So I'll do my best. Um, not a competition, right? Um, so uh, we offer a lot of the same things, interestingly, as, as what um, Ontario Tech uh, has, um, but we, we probably take a different, um, different tack in, in how we make them available. Um, one thing we do that, that I, I didn't hear Emily say in her great big long list of things is, um, is that we offer recreation passes, museum passes, and park passes. So we, we, of course, with books, you, know, you can be taken away you know, metaphorically, but you know, when you come to the library and borrow these passes, you can literally uh, go somewhere physically to, ex to experience something. So our rec passes gets you access to our, 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 our Del Park Home Center. You can go skating, you can go swimming, or you could go to, um, we have cloaca passes. Uh, we, have, um, we have passes that'll get you access to Ontario parks. We have museum passes um, that uh, grant you access to the Canadian Automotive Museum, the Ontario Regimental Museum, Parkwood, uh, the Oshawa Museum, etc. Et so I think a lot of people wouldn't wouldn't be familiar with with that fact. Um, we also um, dabble with the library of 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 things, although to a lesser lesser degree. Um, but we we soon and and Jen can speak more about this uh, when if we if she has an opportunity. We we will soon have uh, sensory kits for people who are on the uh, uh, autism spectrum, and in these backpacks they have. Um, they have uh, headphones, glasses, and fidgets, and, and pop tubes, and bubble timers, and all sorts of uh, things for people who are on the spectrum um, to, to, to help them and to calm them. So um, other libraries have gone um, pretty in, in interesting uh, directions with their libraries of things, including art and tools and pickleball kits and instruments and exercise equipment and, and technology and you name it, uh, public libraries have probably tried to loan it out. Um, on the emerging technology front, um, we have video game stations in, in our library. That's new uh, for McLaughlin in our, in our, in our teen zone. Um, it is steam based or it's not powered by steam, but steam is the platform that, that, that we use to access uh, a, a range of, of, of video games appropriate for, for our, our teen users. Um, we have virtual reality headsets, uh, also 3D printing. We have a vinyl cutter and, and also podcasting equipment for people who want to sort of flex their creative muscles and, and, and create original content themselves. Something that I think is really cool about what we're doing is, is our, we have connect kits, which we can make available for 
users who don't have the internet at home. So one of the things libraries do and have done throughout history is try and reduce the digital divide and try and bridge that chasm. And uh, many would believe that uh, connectivity and access to the internet is a human right. And, and we believe that no one should be without the internet. It's, it's vital when getting a job or, or going to school and just getting through life and applying to the services you need to. So we can provide you with a Wi-Fi hotspot and a tablet. Um, and, um, and we've talked about digital resources. We have streaming services like Hoopla and Freegal. So you can uh, download music, you can download TV shows, you can download movies through, um, through these platforms, eBooks and audiobooks through cloud, cloud library, language learning through Mango. Uh, you can get tutoring help through a platform called BrainFuse and if LinkedIn Learning's been, been discussed. Another unique feature of our branch in McLaughlin is our local history room. So we don't have a, a, an archives like the universities might have, but we have a local history room where you can access digitized collections of newspapers, of war diaries, access ancestry online to research your, your family tree. We collaborate with other galleries, libraries, museums, and archives to do um, local history spotlights. We bring in authors to talk about uh, the history of the Oshawa area. And finally, before I uh, mercifully stop talking, is, is uh, we offer tax clinics for, for low income earners, which is a truly inspiring program to, to, to see in action. And, and if, you, if you qualify, we, we link you up with a volunteer and, and uh, this person has, has qualifications and in, in, of course in, in fields related to accounting and such, and we'll prepare tax returns um, for you. So these are ways we're helping, helping people in, in, in very meaningful and substantial ways. Thanks, David. That's great. Okay, Vicki, uh, what's happening at Trent? So I can't yeah. one up my colleagues here with their with their amount of things that they have at their library. Uh, the uh, Trent University's Durham Campus Library and Learning Center is quite small, so it's probably comparable in size to the library here in this building in Charles Hall, and so. Although we don't have many things, the things we do have are pretty great, such as happy lamps. So happy lamps are, are uh, definitely very great to loan out. We also have microphones available for podcasting. We also have a digital camera, so students can actually sign that out. Um, in addition to online resources, we do provide copyright support. Um, so that's something people don't think of the libraries being involved with, with copyright. So what that looks like is faculty and instructors may have copyright questions, such as, can they use a particular material in class without having to pay any fees to the copyright holder? So those are the kind of questions that my uh, staff and I do tackle every single day and we answer and help with some of those. Um, in addition, Trent University has a very unique, in the library and archives, a very unique department called MAPS Data Government Information Center, uh, or the acronym is MAGIC, and that assists with gathering data. And so they get researchers from across Canada who uh, contact them to help gather data, collect it, as well as learning how to analyze data. So in connection with that, what I'm very excited about that's upcoming is that I will be getting a data visualization satellite terminal, which will have many of the software to actually process a lot of this data and get students to be able to learn how to use these software that will be skills for the future. Um, additionally, I am currently working with my colleagues to start a board game collection. So that will be for recreational use. And uh, I'm partnering with a local board game store here in Oshawa, the Gamers Table. It's not that uh, old. They've only been in business for one year. So it's a bit of a shameless plug, but I was meeting with the owner today and we're very excited that we will be able to purchase and then provide those out to students to, to lend out. So that will be something very surprising that an academic library actually does, lending out some recreational games. That is fantastic and certainly supports the, you know, the wellness of your student population. Fantastic. Well, 
So it is just uh, uh, amazing what libraries do. And um, we have about uh, eight minutes left. So I'd like to open up the uh, audience questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions in the audience for our panelists, uh, feel free to either put them in the chat for you folks on Zoom, uh, or you can unmute your mic and just uh, ask your question. Um, and if any uh, of our in-person attendees have any questions, please feel free to throw them out. A happy lamp is designed so some people have seasonal um, disorders associated with darkness, especially during winter months. Um, sometimes that's acronym is sad. And so these lamps are designed to improve a person's energy and mood. So if they're they're they are low light level, but they are designed so that people will get enough light to stimulate them as well as to, to help uh, alleviate some of the problems associated with that disorder, those seasonal disorders. Good question. So the question was, in case uh, people didn't hear, is can public libraries host programs on uh, misinformation on uh pup on sorry on misinformation how how to decipher misinformation versus factual information and that that that's an excellent question yes um it's in in the time of age where there's so much information out there on the internet and there's a lot of false information there's a lot of untruths um that's a really great question and it's something that we, we definitely would be thrilled to offer and maybe partner with our uh, academic libraries uh, with that too. I smell mm -hmm. a collaborative program coming. I, yes, I, I, uh, yes, absolutely. I, I can feel that collaboration happening already. Um, good, good ask. Any others? I don't know if we have, oh, yes, go ahead. That's a good question. And the answer is no. So our like, we're bound by license agreements with, with vendors and publishers, and they have really strict parameters about who the authorized users are for remote access, and that's current student, staff, and faculty. Um, it's that walk-in exception that allows people to be physically present in the library to access our resources. That's the million-dollar question everybody wants online access. You can get remote access through our resources through the public library, however. Yeah. No, 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 just ours. <laughs> there, there's no back door, but all of our um, all of our online resources are accessible from home. I, th I think except for maybe Ancestry Online, again, due to licensing agreements. But um, yeah, with the library card, with the digital library card and, and uh, you know, and a traditional library card, um, all of our digital resources are available 24 seven. Yeah, absolutely. So we have we have a number of programs that supports learning how to use our technology. And then we also have sorry, David, I'm cutting in here. Um, <laughs> uh, we also have one to one tech help appointments. So for anybody who is uh, you know, inquisitive or maybe struggling with uh, with, you know, the latest technology, you, you can call into the library, any branch and book a one-to-one -one tech help appointment. So whether or not it's to learn how to use our library resources, whether it's, you know, the um, your mom might be struggling with how to use a cell phone, for instance, you know, that often can be a challenge or an iPad or something. So certainly we, you just can call in and uh, book an appointment and we're happy to help, uh, help teach people either one-to-one -one or enroll in any one of our many programs that we have. All right. Well, if there's no questions from our virtual audience, uh, I don't see anything in the chat. Jen, you haven't seen anything in the chat. All right. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank you, panelists, Vicki, Emily, and David, for your insightful and thought-provoking thought um, 
discussion about your libraries. You certainly do amazing work and, uh, and bring a lot of benefit to the community. We're really happy to partner with the local universities and uh, we think that it's a wonderful relationship and we really look forward to, uh, to uh, growing, growing opportunities. Um, yes. So I'd like to thank the Faculty of Social, uh, Social Sciences and Humanities for hosting us tonight. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you at home, wherever you may be logging into uh, for tuning in. We have a couple other programs that will be coming up uh, in shortly. So please do look for them. I think we're offering one in November and one in December. And uh, yes, I, I wish you all a great evening. Thank you so much.